Good morning. I'm Hank Hine. Um, I'm the museum director, and William Jeffett and I curated this show, uh, Frida Kahlo, At the Dolly. So the title was just to say that we have put these two artists together, and um, how wonderful and satisfying it was for William and I and our collaborators to present a woman artist uh, of such power uh, here at the Dolly Museum. And this is a photograph by a Mexican photographer named Lola Alvarez Bravo, uh, a wonderful photographer. And you will see here that we see Frida twice. There's a Frida looking in and a Frida looking out. And that's really the thesis of the exhibition, uh, that these beautiful works of art of hers can tell us two stories, a story of suffering and a story of ascent and uh, overcoming of suffering. Uh, you'll see at her feet there, uh, uh, these this, uh, dogs, uh, she called them Xolo Cuitle. Uh, this is a, a traditional Mexican uh, animal. Uh, Aztec mythology tells us that the dog was given to man by the spirits as his protector. And we also know from archaeologic ruins uh, that, that they were also sent as a food source. So protectors and sustainers in every way. Uh, so they're bred to be hairless. And uh, Mexican hairlesses are actually uh, a traditional dog and have a real emotional import for Mexicans. So when we talk about two Fridas, um, we can go many directions. She was an artist who wrote, and she was an artist that presented herself visually. She was a journalist as well as a painter. Um, she also had two selves as Lola Alvarez Bravo presented in the prior photograph. And this journal entry describes, and you can see it's been written twice, which is interesting, uh, describes an experience she had uh, at the age of six. And she would stand in her bedroom at the window and frost the glass window pane. And then she would draw another window, a second window, and rub it clear. And then she would imaginatively pass through that glass across the street into the building that was there. It was actually a store. And she would ascend, descend to the basement. And there she would meet her second self. A girl just like Frida, but without polio, and Frida had contracted polio that year, uh, gayer, happier, more jaunty, more athletic, uh, unencumbered by any of the world's cares. And um, she visited that second self when she needed to be raised. And I would ask you to consider that that window formally might be considered to be what painting became for her, that rectangle from which she could pass her suffering self into another realm. Another entry from her journal. Now, an essential part of Frida is an understanding of an essential part of the Mexican identity. Modern Mexico, and that is Mexico in this era for the last several hundred years, is a hybrid culture. It's a fusion of European and indigenous traditions, values, impulses, foods, costumes, customs, celebrations, beliefs. And in many ways, Frida embodies this duality of the Aztec or Miztec uh, origin and the European. This is uh, from a codex which were the books, the codex, meaning the folio, uh, th that the uh, indigenous people were making uh, at the time 
of Cortes. And it's interesting to note that when they talk about the era before Europe in Mexico, they don't call it pre-Columbian. Remember, Columbus landed in uh, uh, the Caribbean and didn't make it to the mainland, but Cortes did. And so they call it pre-Cortesian, pre-Cortesian, before the era of Cortes. So Allison has assembled some very beautiful collections of, of letters here uh, to show you how she worked, image and text. And she was, as many people of, of um, culture and intellect at that time, uh, a, a prolific letter writer. She wrote to all her friends, that's how you communicated. You didn't send texts, you didn't get on the phone, you wrote a letter. You might have enclosed a photograph in that. And it took a couple of weeks to get where you wanted it to go. Um, I'd like to introduce this great love of her life, uh, Diego Rivera here. And you can read how poetic the language is. My Diego, mirror of the night, your eyes, green swords inside my flesh, waves between our hands and onward. She loved Diego passionately, uh, but in general, she loved passionately, and her life was filled with other people, as well as her painting, and I think we sense that in her painting as well. There she sits next to a portrait of Diego that she has just completed. In her studio, you can see the volcanic stone uh, of the wall behind her, and the house was made of volcanic stone, a beautiful home constructed by her father in the early part of the 20th century. And here she describes to friends Ellen Bertram Wolf uh, her experience in Paris. And we'll take a closer look at that. But you can see she recounts in detail um, what she went through in Paris with her first show. And she mentions that uh, André Breton, who we'll visit again in a moment, uh, did not uh, perform as he had promised in terms of getting her, uh, her work into the gallery. But uh, surprisingly, the man who did perform was Marcel Duchamp. And she revered him as an artist and as a person. So there's André Breton looking very French, very confident. Um, one thing about Breton, though, he may not have been able to follow through on that promise of an exhibition, but he wrote well, and he had exquisite taste. And he saw uh, Frida's work, and in spite of all what he might have celebrated in Mexico, he identified Frida as a great talent. This is uh, uh, two letters to Nicholas Murray. She's uh, come back from Paris from her first show, and she's seen him in New York. Uh, they've had a long relationship. He is a photographer, um, takes a lot of the great photos of Frida and Diego, and she made clear to him that their, that is, Diego and her relationship was uh, unsurpassable. But she had a, a long love affair with Nicholas Murray. And in the first letter, she tells what a relief it was to get his reply after her stay with him in New York. And in the second letter, she's responding to uh, uh, a letter in which he's written to her and cut off the relationship, letting her know that in the couple of short months since she saw him, he has gotten married. And you can see she turns, uh, turns this into the most favorable approach that she could have, telling him that he has great character and, and that, after all, that kind of honesty is all that matters. So there is uh, uh, Nicholas Murray behind her and uh, Frida's two sisters with her. So 
we always have to think about Mexico as, as image, as iconography, when we, we look at Frida. It's very telling to do so. So here we have uh, what's called the Codex Mendoza, which was an Im important document. Now you have to understand that at the time that Cortez came, these books were ubiquitous. They uh, recorded um, how corn should be uh, stored, the best way to tan uh, deer, um, the lucky days of the month, how to succeed as a merchant, how to succeed as a hunter, who their gods were, where they came from. These were the texts that told their entire story, and of course, immediately, the priests burned them. So there were about a dozen of these books saved, and they are named after uh, the place where they ended up, or the person to whom they were gifted. Sometimes, because the soldiers, uh, the leaders of Cortez's group, uh, were so obligated for their finances to a nobleman back at home, they would grab one of these things and send it to them, just so there'd be some kind of material culture they could uh, share uh, to show that they were really there in Mexico and really working, and isn't it a strange place, and we are going to save the souls of these strange people. But uh, the hybrid quality, you can see that this was done after, uh, after post-Cortez, um, and they're still using the iconography, uh, the symbolic images, the images that represent uh, language, in a sense. And next to it, the interlinear uh, is the Spanish that they have been taught, or at least the Roman alphabet uh, transliterating the language uh, of the Aztecs. And another part of Mexican culture is uh, an a really embrace of physical suffering, an embrace of blood and the mortal nature of us all, rather than um, rather than refuting that and ignoring that, as we tend to do in a in our Puritan-based culture, suffering and death is something to be embraced uh, in Mexico, and you'll find that today. Uh, those of you who are going to uh, travel um, with our group, and uh, Jody Morelli has some information about a, a trip we're taking the day after uh, the exhibition ends, that is April 18th, going to uh, Mexico City and, and seeing uh, Frida's house and some other wonderful, surreal, and typical Mexican experiences. Um, this, this suffering, uh, when you look at a, a Kahlo painting, remember that she's talking about a fact of life. She's not asking you for pity because uh, this is just what we understand. So the angel uh, can hold the beating heart. And this is the icon, it looks a bit elongated, but this is Guadalupe, mother of Mexico. And uh, if you've ever have you ever been, has anyone ever seen this in the Basilica in Mexico City? Yes, yes. And did they have the uh, moving platform? So you can't actually stand in front of it. You have to stand this thing that moves because they, they want to get you out of the way. Uh, but there it is. And this is uh, one of the central um, motivating images and concepts in Mexican culture. And interestingly for me, uh, it comes out of an act of printing. Now, the story goes that the, the very early days after the conquest, uh, an Indian named Juan Diego was traveling uh, on the behest of the bishop uh, over the mountains. And at the top of the mountain, he encountered Guadalupe, the spirit of, of Christ through Mary, who they called Guadalupe, and she said, uh, I want you to become a Christian and tell the bishop that you have seen me. You have experienced a miracle. And Juan Diego says, no one's going to believe me that I, he'll think it's primitive Indian things. He won't believe that I encountered a spirit. And she said, here, gather these roses that have grown even in winter. And he gathered the roses and he held them in his serape, 
And when he got to the bishop, he told the story, and the bishop shook his head. And then he said, and she gave me these roses. And he threw down the roses. But on his serape was this image of Guadalupe. So the rose had imprinted on his serape the image of Guadalupe. And this central miracle in Mexican culture begins with a, an act of printing. If, if there are any printmakers here, you can say hallelujah. <laughs> and interestingly, printing has been very important in Mexican history, too. It was very important in the Mexican Revolution, 1910, started in 1910. Uh, this is a, a, an Olmec sculpture. Olmec were the first, the earliest people we know about in the Americas. Many, many hundreds and hundreds of years, probably about 4,000 before current era. Um, and they used something called cinnabar. And so they, they held pigments to be sacred. So I think that's another connection, that the act of painting connects you to spirit because of, of uh, the, the indigenous traditions and the power of paint. So I want to talk about the power of Mexico influencing Frida, and then Frida's power in influencing the world. Uh, this is a painting. Uh, this was one of the paintings that Breton saw, and it's called What the Water Gave Me. And you can see it's just prototypically surrealist. It's a, a, a collage within you know, a domestic scene. So the uh, fantastic comes in contact with the ordinary. It's a bathtub filled with her life and filled with images and biographical things, spiritual things. Um, and thinking of her power, it, her power certainly touched André Breton and led to her being known in North America and in Europe. Uh, this is an image uh, by Graciela Iturbide, who's one of the leading photographers of our era. Uh, a Mexican photographer, and Graciela uh, was able to photograph in 2005 um, Frida's bathroom. And it had been sealed off by Diego Rivera's uh, dictum for 50 years after her death. He said no one will go into her bathroom and see her private things for 50 years. Um, and now it's part of the, the Casa Azul, the museum of Frida. Um, but you can see she's uh, trying to fit herself into the groove of, of Frida and her, her, um, her images. So where do these images come from? I've hinted that Mexico and its traditions will have a big part of, of her development as an artist. But we want to also think about the context of Mexico at that moment. Now, Frida is there uh, in the middle. Uh, and on her left, that is to your right, uh, is Diego Rivera. And uh, Diego uh, is the most well-known painter in North America in 1930. He's so well known that he's hired uh, in San Francisco to do uh, a mural for the stock exchange. He's brought to Detroit for the Ford Motor Company to uh, do their headquarters and to do the newly formed Detroit Art Institute. He's brought to New York by the Rockefellers to do the fresco uh, for the Rockefeller Center. And his mode of art is um, quite different than what we see in Frida. He and two or three other really well-known muralists had set uh, a new approach, which was really based in the Renaissance of being able to show grand public historical uh, and religious themes in public places. So fresco was developed for that because of its ability uh, in scale and its durability. And fresco, as you know, is uh, a coat of plaster painted while it's still damp so that the pigment actually enters 
in the same way the cinnabar entered that Olmec figure, the paint actually goes into the plaster and becomes uh, very, very permanent. And you use water-based uh, mineral pigments so that you really are putting stone into limestone. So you're setting something that lasts forever if the uh, climatic conditions are such. So The Last Supper, is, as you know, is, is also a fresco, but it's had problems because of the humidity uh, in the monasteries it's been, it was held. So Diego paints grand public scenes. He celebrates the working man. He celebrates industry. And at that time, industry and the working person were thought to be fused in a great promise for a utopian tomorrow. Labor and technology. They would create a, a vast world of abundance in which everyone would share. That was the hope. But Frida had a very different vision. Here she is on the day she married Diego. Uh, it's 1929. Uh, she's 22 years old. And she gets a lot of her identity starting out, of course. Uh, as radical as she is as a person, as bold and uh, as free, she also is recognized as the wife of Diego Rivera, which is a great asset to her. So this is a show that she had in the United States in 1938, Frida Kahlo, parenthesis, Frida Rivera. So that's just a, a, a way of trying to uh, bolster her in a world where um, Mexican women artists are not known, but Diego Rivera is certainly known. And this is the, uh, the little catalog for the show that she finally achieved in, uh, in Paris with the help of, of uh, uh, Marcel Duchamp. And if you look down there, you can see the gallery name, uh, Renou École, C-O-L-L-E. And just to give you a sense of, of uh, the, the connections in the surreal world. You know, the surreal concept is that the world is this ball of luminous connections in which nothing is apart from anything else, and all meaning is achieved through understanding the purveyance of connections and meaning. So Pierre Cole, who gives her his, a show, also gave Dali his first show in France. And then, interestingly, this cookbook, Frida's Fiestas, is written by Marie Pierco, who's the daughter of Pierco. When Frida comes back from Paris, she stops in New York, and she sees the uh, daughter of of, uh, of Lucien, the son. I'm sorry, the son of Lucien Bloch. Now, Lucien Bloch was Diego's. Uh, studio assistant when they arrived in San Francisco. Now, Frida is fiery and a young bride, and she knows that uh, Diego is known as being a very attractive to women. Um, and so at the dinner uh, celebrating the project in San Francisco, Lucien Black, his assistant, is seated next to, to Diego. And Frida is across the table, and uh, as Lucien tells the story, uh, Frida stared at her, stared daggers at her <laughs> through the entire dinner, and then went over to her and said, I hate you. <laughs> so she's very direct, <laughs> she's very honest, but she's also quite playful. And um, I think one of the interesting resolutions is that she became great friends with Lucien Bloch. They, they had a, a wonderful friendship, and she collaborated with Lucien on uh, the exquisite corpse, on uh, the surrealist drawing game. And there are two that survive with Frida and Lucien working together. So she stops in and she sees Lucien and Lucien's son. And in, in a sense, that's the kind of resolution because there's been the trauma of not being able to have a child. So you can see the milieu she is in. It's a group of artists. There are not a lot of women in the group, a few. Um, and she's um, 
reconciled to, to this wonderful role that really, before people recognize her talent, is her privilege being, being Diego's wife. But let's talk about her character a little bit. Look at this uh, photo. This is a family photo. She's on the far left. Now, this is a formal family photo about 1920 in Mexico. And everybody's dressed to the nines. And can you imagine? Uh, so your teenage daughter comes out in, in her father's suit for the formal. And he says, what are you doing? Go back and change. No. This is how I'm being photographed. So she's bold and uh, quite stridently different from the bourgeois society of middle class Mexico of that time. Now, Frida said her life was defined by two accidents. This one, in which she was riding in a bus with her boyfriend at that time, and the bus was hit by a trolley car. And um, there's a, a, a marvelously poetic description of this by her boyfriend, um, describing how the bus is hit mid-drift by the streetcar. And the streetcar keeps moves the bus sideways. And it says it goes on for the longest time. And the bus has this great elasticity. And it, it pushes and pushes. And then finally, it bursts. And in that burst of energy, one of the handrails goes through Frida at the level of the pelvis, hip to hip. And this is why she can't have children. And she doesn't learn that until a series of miscarriages during her life. She said that the, that was the first accident that defined her, and the second accident was meeting and marrying Diego Rivera. <laughs> so the drawing I just showed you was done a year after the accident. At the time of the accident, she was a student of medicine. She wanted to be a doctor. And now she's confined to bed. And um, a year later, she does that drawing. Uh, four years after that, uh, she does uh, a painting that reflects on that bus ride in the moments before the accident. So you can see she's gotten a kind of retrospective grip on it. And she's going back to the moment, not of the accident, but of, of a world that was innocent and clear of, of the traumas that would come subsequently. And it's a, a lovely view of Mexico, too, because you can see there the, the bus has all types of people. Some have shoes, some do not. Men and women, you know, thigh to thigh, riding in the same world. And you can see her sitting primly on the far right uh, with her scarf blowing in this open-air bus. Uh, the signs of industry in the background, a burgeoning Mexican uh, industrialism that's going to bring uh, prosperity to this country. Uh, this is the kind of, of painting that, uh, um, that uh, kind of fresco. Uh, this was originally at the Palacio de Bellas Artes. It was originally at the uh, Rockefeller Center. It was moved to the Palacio de Bellas Artes, the wonderful uh, uh, art, uh, art Nouveau uh, theater in the center of Mexico City. Um, it was in that theater that uh, Carlos Fuentes, whose quotes are on the wall upstairs in the exhibition, first saw her in the early 50s and called her an Aztec goddess, a broken Cleopatra. So you can see the, the immense range of, of Rivera's work. He's looking at hundreds and hundreds of people, the masses. He has industrial things at the center. Uh, all kinds of references and um, classical sculptures and learned people declaiming kind of historical vignettes all there in the moment. Uh, man, controller of the universe. So it's this very optimistic um, social sense. Frida, on the other hand, did portraits, largely. And her approach to the portrait, you can see this is an early one, uh, she's still probably in bed at this time, and her father has created uh, an easel system for her so that she can paint from the bed. 
This is a, a portrait of a friend of hers, and you can see there's a kind of Renaissance composure to it, the kind of uh, portrait that would have been done of, of a lady or a gentleman at the time. Um, but please note also that there's a, a, a kind of fracture of the foreground and the background. Now, the Renaissance, as we know, was noted for this Renaissance space in which there's this perspectival diminishment from, from the viewer all the way to the horizon. And that development has a lot of intellectual um, potency because it meant that space could be understood. It means that space is rational, that the world is rational. And if you understand it, you can also control it. So the Renaissance promises control, and, and she has choose that here. She uses a, a gesture towards the Renaissance, but she has this flattened background. And notice the frontal, slightly turned to the side view. Um, this is a, a photo by Alvarez Bravo, Lola's husband of Frida. And that approach to the figure is going to be pervasive for her. She's not going to have a lot of people. She's not going to have a lot of technology. She's going to show a single image. Uh, this is her father, and she learned that approach from him. He was a, a photographer, and she had worked as his assistant. So he does a lot of portraits, and she um, studies the way he uses props, places the figure, but always in that formal presentation. So this is a fascinating character. His name is Luther Burbank. And you can see that this is a, a preparatory drawing. Uh, you can note the central features, a man, you know, foliage, his legs going down underground, and the roots reaching out into uh, the soil, some kind of form at the base of the roots. And from that, she develops this painting, this painting of Luther Burbank. Um, and it's essentially the same image. However, now uh, it's being, this tree is being fed by a corpse. And this is a lovely story in terms of understanding how Frida approached her pictorial uh, success, uh, her pictorial renderings. Uh, this is a historic figure his named Luther Burbank. And um, you know that there were uh, potato famines in Ireland, a lot of, of the population of the United States uh, it, with Irish heritage is due to those potato famines. The staple crop failed. Well, Luther Burbank developed in the late 19th century a hybrid potato that did not fail from the same kind of rust that was affecting it. And uh, it was one of hundreds of hybrid plants that he developed. So he would graft the elements of one plant onto another, and he created uh, an abundance of food supply that, that led to uh, a lot of the increase of population in the early 20th century. Uh, so for Frida, because she has these populist leanings, as did Diego, he's a hero. He increased the food supply. He's also a hero to her because he essentially embraced the Mexican concept of death giving birth to new life, uh, because at his death, he had himself buried at the foot of, of a tree on his farm in Santa Rosa, California. So here you see him being resurrected from his own corpse, uh, the cycle of life, and giving forth green plants in abundance to the world. So truly a hero to her. And plants, of course, were extremely important to her. Here she is in her garden at the Casa Azul. Um, you will, I hope, take time to go to our garden today. We've essentially replicated uh, an essential part of her garden. She had a little pyramid of plants. And we've used many of the plants that have been documented as being part of her garden in our own garden in an homage to her. And it's, it's actually much more uh, colorful than that. As you can see, this is the Casa Azul and, and what it would look like uh, in, a, uh, in a nice season. An early portrait 
of Frida is, is of, of a girl who was presumably a servant in her household. Middle class people in Mexico had servants. And this little girl, uh, you can see, looks a lot like Frida. And we have upstairs uh, the verso of this painting. After she painted this little girl, uh, she turned it over and did a self-portrait in exactly the same posture. But if you look closely at this little girl, you can see that she has the characteristic Frida single brow. She's got a, a, a little wisp of mustache on her upper lip. And Frida treats uh, her own self-portrait in exactly that way. So Frida's self-taught, and she's learning uh, how to render. She obviously has great talent in it, and you can see that right from the start, she likes a kind of dreamlike, surreal approach to the image. And here she uh, copies uh, her left eye um, and puts it on her shoulder. Um, here she's using uh, real surreal approaches to the image. Um, she's drawing herself lying naked on a bed and her hair uh, streams out into roots and into aerial roots and connects all the things of her life. Uh, and right there at the center is Diego. So she had a combination of privilege and tragedy in her life with, with Diego. Uh, they go to Detroit. He's working on this mural. He's celebrating the machinery of Detroit. He's celebrating man's inventive industrial capacity. Um, she, at that point, has become pregnant and, and has a miscarriage. And uh, following it, uh, she takes a class at a little art school in in uh, Detroit, and uh, she, it's a lithography class, so she makes a lithograph. Um, and in it, you can see that she's approaching her self-portrait as though there are two Fridas. You can see on the left, um, there's more light. On the, the right, uh, the figure's cloudy. Uh, there's tears uh, everywhere, though, uh, right on her cheeks and in the air. The right side, her painting, the power of the moon and sun, uh, decay, things decaying. And on the left, um, a diagram of cellular division and the fetus that she lost. So the, the art and the tragedy put side by side. The, the writing on the, the margin, though, was really interesting. It was by her instructor. Um, and uh, any of you who have gotten faint praise from a teacher uh, understand that Frida went on uh, in spite of that. He writes, uh, this is neither good nor bad. Uh, keep working. Uh, here's a painting of the same subject. Um, you can see the, the iconography. <clears throat> it's almost allegorical. I mean, that's not a real scene the bed, the blood, but then these things floating, which sort of represent her world. Um, and most of it's there, a, a flower, uh, a diagram of, uh, of a torso, her, her hip structure, her pelvis with the fractured pelvis, some kind of medical device, a snail, perhaps referring to the slow pace of childbirth, uh, a faded uh, flower, uh, but guess who's not there? Yeah. But what you have is the industrial scene that he was involved in. And so you get her in isolation. Uh, this is a self-portrait reclining. And it leads us uh, into something very topical. But I want you to see that you have to consider with Frida that every portrait, in a sense, is a self-portrait. And I don't know, I, I, perhaps that can be said um, productively of art history in general, that portraits are always, in a sense, a self-portrait. Uh, but when you look at that figure and the pose uh, done at the same time is, uh, is this image of, uh, yeah, of a murder that she read about in the newspaper. And um, a couple of things to note about it. One is that <coughs> that uh, it's, it's a historical event, something that she read about. 
So she's responding to something that's topical. The second is she's using a technique and a structure that's completely traditional in Mexico, the tradition of the retabla. And uh, we've got a couple of examples of retablas. Usually they were small, on tin, uh, formally naive. That is, there's not a great, a lot of attention to perspective. Um, and usually there's writing, and in the birds holding up uh, this banner would be typical of in a retabla. Usually they show, though, delivery from near misfortune because of the intervention of a god. And here there's no intervention, no redemption. The man stands there stupidly over the corpse, and when he was brought for arraignment, the judge asked him, to explain himself, why he did this. And he said, I only gave her a few small nips. So it's a, it's a castigation of, of male uh, violence, um, and it's using, uh, it's making a statement about redemption too, because there is no redemption in this. The, the gods do not interfere. And uh, a portrait, um, which is, actually a very traditional kind of approach to a young child who died, presumably from sickness. So Frida at this time uh, is starting to embrace her uh, native uh, Mexican traditions. She starts wearing jewelry uh, based in Aztec jewelry, all kind of archaeologically retrieved because middle class people would wear the costume jewelry from Paris and New York if they could, not these rocks. Uh, and she explores that heritage. And uh, this is called My Nanny and Me, Mi Nana y Yo. Uh, and in it, you can see she's mature in her head and the body of a child, and she's suckling. Uh, from a nurse who actually obviously represents not a person so much, but as a tradition. She looks like a stone figure there, um, a little like this stone figure, which is uh, found right in her, the land she grew up in. Um, and you can see that the, um, the milk ducks are like f plants. And there's this conflation of nourishment and botany that we saw with the Luther Burbank images, the, the sustenance of plants, the sustenance of milk. In this era, she uh, surrenders a lot to her dreams and uses them, mines them for images. Uh, this, this one called Fantasy, you can see a, a, an eye in the middle that looks quite a bit like Dolly's Eye of Time. Um, and then can you see the two volcanoes, the famous volcanoes surrounding Mexico City, which are erupting milk, and the milk flows down into the land, and there's semen flowing as well, but they all uh, just kind of end up in the arroyo down there. So there's this sense of, of the loss of the f potential of fecundity. Now, this is, uh, I think, also a self-portrait. It's called uh, The Flower of Life. And uh, I think it's um, a, a plant-animal hybrid. You can see the hands look like fallopian tubes. Um, there's, um, looks like a penal structure emerging where the head should be. There's this flash of, of, of spore going outward. There's, a, there's lightning describing creation. And then that's either the sun or um, or the uh, formed zygote of creation. So I think Frida is seeing herself as uh, a plant for a couple of reasons. One is that the plant is, is very, uh, many plants have both sexes. And so Frida was uh, bisexual in her romantic life. And so she's identifying with the plant. And then, of course, the plant and sustenance and her celebration of that sustenance. Here she does a portrait, uh, you'll see this upstairs, of the mother of her primary patron. Of course, Diego is supporting her um, in her living. He, he has no problem getting lots of money. Um, 
And, but one man uh, who was an ambassador uh, to Mexico uh, bought a lot of her paintings. And this is a portrait of her mother, of his mother, and you can kind of feel uh, her, <laughs> uh, you can see how Frida has become very insightful about character. You can see there's a kind of ambivalence in this woman's look like, all right, you're painting me, what are you seeing? You know, what, what do you see? Do you have any idea what life is like when you've done as much as I have and knitted as many sweaters for grandchildren and, and, and here's what I get. I'm, I'm old and you think I'm a subject for a painting. I don't know, that's how I read it. But uh, once again, you see the foreground and background, very typical, you know, there. And the background is always symbolic of the foreground. The background is thorny, like her expression, but the, the thorny cactus also gives forth a flower, which is very beautiful. And this is what her life is like at this point. Uh, you know, that she merges in social. This is uh, circles. This is an artist next to her named Carvarubius. 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 Can we all say Covarubias? Thank you. Uh, and Diego and Frida. And here she is with her family in the, the very uh, nice home and her sister, uh, Christina. Um, when we say that all portraits are self-portraits, you recall the few small nips. Uh, it's, it's also a kind of allegory of Diego's slaying of Frida through his infidelities, uh, because that innocent girl on the right, uh, Christina, who's just a year younger than Frida, uh, moves in and, and lives with Diego while, while Frida's away. So he sees that as a symbolic murder, and uh, thus that painting. Uh, but she has a social life. She's out with friends, uh, and she's starting, I think, to get... Um, a grasp on the two sides of her condition here. So this is called The Broken Column, and it's probably one of the most celebrated of her paintings. You know, she painted very little, so it's easy to choose your favorite. Uh, in it, you get, uh, I think, again, an allegory. It's, a, it's about her suffering. It's about her physical condition. It's also about, the, about painting, I think. Um, You'll see her, she's been cut open, you know, from midriff to neck. Um, she's wearing the corsets that she had to wear because of her problems following the accident. Um, and then she's pierced with nails. So that is a reference to one of the great subjects of Western art, which is St. Sebastian. And Sebastian is pierced with arrows. He doesn't die, but he suffers greatly uh, for his devotion and his faith. And so she sees herself as a, a Sebastian too. And you'll note that the paintings in the Renaissance of Sebastian, Saint Sebastian, he, he always was, uh, in Dali's era, em, embraced as a kind of uh, figure of homosexual appeal. He's always uh, beautifully shaped limbs and very handsome and youthful when he undergoes this. So, in the same way, there's a sexual availability here of, of Frida, but then a, a renunciation, renunciation of, of that sexuality because of her kind of martyrdom, of her taking the nails of humanity uh, because of her faith. And again, the background is the, is the land. It, uh, it's, it's barren, isn't it? There's nothing growing. Uh, and that column, which is uh, an ionic column, uh, obviously represents classical Greece, represents uh, the, the tradition of painting, um, and it's broken, it's fractured. So she's had to go elsewhere. She's not going to follow the traditions of North America. She's not going to follow the traditions of her husband. She's going to paint a new kind of painting. I think we all have been elevated by her uh, having found a new approach combining the old. Uh, this painting um, is just too depressing to spend much time on. Um, her father fashioned this easel, but the easel is not 
deliver, liberating her. It's uh, funneling all the burdens of you know the flesh and the world uh, into her, and she uh, she weeps there. You can see the tears. And again, the the zygote or the, the blastophon, there the the newly formed living creature, perhaps, or the sun, and then the moon. Again, referring to the Aztec and their heritage. Uh, Diego Rivera's grandson, who's an artist, says that uh, this is indeed a, an allegorical painting. Uh, it's called The Little Chicken. And The Little Chicken is, is you and I. And uh, it stands there under all these threatening, huge, outscaled bugs, but also all in a plant with the shape of, uh, of the cloud of Hiroshima. And this painting was painted in 1945, and he says it was a direct response to that terrible event and, and posing the question, you know, what will protect us? What is the future of mankind? Can we avoid these, these predators and demons? But again, in a very personal, uh, modest painting. Um, this painting um, is called The Mask of Madness. And I think it's a lovely study in, in what Frida's idea of suffering is. Um, you can see the, 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 the purple hair um, represents a kind of fiesta. So this is something that's probably based in uh, a real fiesta in Mexico. Um, but it's the mask that is crying. And underneath the mask, you can see the little gouged out eyes. Someone is looking out from behind. And you can surmise by the hair and by the fact that she paints self-portraits that this is Frida behind the mask. So if it's not Frida who suffers, if Frida is not the one shedding the tears, what, what is Frida's state? It's very enigmatic and I think wonderful to consider. The last painting in our exhibition um, is, I think, a kind of summary of her life. Again, looking at allegory, looking at uh, the painting as an extended metaphor. Uh, there she is. It's obviously a self-portrait. Uh, she's looking out at the, you know, with the same kind of gaze that we see in this portrait. Um, and she has here all the elements of her life, if you look at them as metaphors. Uh, there's the Aztec figurine, which represents her tradition, her heritage. Uh, there's the monkey. Now, you'd have to know Diego was famous for owning monkeys. So there's Diego. And there's Sholo, her protector, the dog. And if you look at the, the gazes carefully, I think everyone's looking away from us, except that dog. And that dog, <laughs> that protector, is watching us. Frida looks a little aside. The monkey looks down. Um, and what connects these things? This ribbon. And the ribbon, I think, is, is um, symbolic of her, her art, that her world is held together loosely, mind you, very loosely, but uh, uh, continuously by this ribbon that encircles her name, which is what, you know, and the date, which is what an artist does, encircles all the creatures in her life, and then uh, encircles the nail uh, in that flat background, which, you know, is a single nail now, not, uh, not the stigmata and not the uh, St. Sebastian arrows, but a single nail on which you might hang a painting. So I think it's symbolic of, of that. Uh, thing that holds her life together. And um, another wonderful photo by uh, Alvarez Bravo uh, of Frida and uh, Laundry. <laughs> but uh, I think you can take that as her second self. And this is another portrait of the two Fridas, the earthbound one and the one lifting in the breeze. So uh, I invite you to see the show now and uh, take a look at these images that you've seen in sequence and get up close because she's a phenomenal painter. Thank you for coming today.